Welcome to the second episode of the First Principles video series. You know, seven years back, we started OCI. When we started OCI, we took a fundamentally different goal around how we approach product and architecture in OCI. One of the key things we wanted to do differently was that, you know, we wanted to build, uh, you know, next gen building blocks and OCI products for our customers that essentially allows customers to, you know, move to the cloud native world and move to the next gen uh, uh, architecture. In this video, we're going to talk about L2 network virtualization, which is a different way by which we are actually taking OCI cloud to our customer's application. And we have with us Lucas Krieger Stickle, our esteemed, my esteemed colleague, uh, who's, uh, you know, among other things, also works on virtual networking. Welcome, Lucas. Thanks. Thanks for chatting with me about this today, Pradeep. Absolutely. All right, cool. So, you know, in, in typically in virtual networking, if you, if you look at public cloud, um, you know, can you actually explain how that typically works? Yeah. So, you know, most cloud virtual networks operate at what we would call layer three um, as a virtual network. And when we talk about layer three, just as a quick recap, we're talking about the OSI model, which is referring to the buildup of networking stacks. And so the layer three is going to be the IP layer. And really the way to think about that, it means that every time we send traffic on a customer's virtualized network, we're directing it on the basis of their destination IP. And to understand what that means, let's, let's get a little bit more concrete. So far so good? So, so if you look at this diagram that we have here, you can think about how every host that we have in the Oracle cloud network is hosted in our infrastructure, right? We run a physical network and physical data centers that we run on behalf of our customers. And every single entity in that physical network has an IP address. We call this sometimes a physical network. You might hear it called an underlay or a substrate network. So associated with every host that we might give to our customers, we have what we call an off-box virtualization device. And it's a separate computer that we use, as you know, to run our networking stack, aspects of our storage stack, and deliver a bunch of other services and security properties to our customers. And it's one of the great things about our Gen2 cloud is we can provide a different level of uh, isolation for customers and guarantees around performance because we, we run in this completely separate device for virtualization. So every one of those devices has a net, an, an IP address on that network. Now, a customer comes and they want to run a virtual network, right? They want to run their own IP address space. They want to have their own policy. And we want to give them the flexibility to place their resources wherever they need to be placed. So when a customer comes to OCI and they launch a compute instance, they make an API call to our compute services and our networking services. And they place that instance on some physical device in our physical data center. And when they do that, we, we keep track, right? Where our control plane will know this is where this virtual machine or where this bare metal instance is in place. And this is where the associated virtual interfaces are placed for that device. That means that the control plane knows every location of every VM in the network, every location of every virtual interface and every location of every IP address in the customer's network on those interfaces. That now allows us to lay on top of that physical network, multiple customer networks, right? So we, again, referring back to the interface, imagine I have uh, host zero here in this diagram and I have host one and the physical network for this purpose, we've said, you know, the off box virtualization device has an address of 10.0.0.0. We have uh, host one is given an address of 10.0.0.1. And now we're able to layer on top of that multiple customer interfaces. And those customer interfaces can exist in different cloud virtual networks or virtual cloud network or VCN. And the customer can choose whatever IP address they want to be associated with those interfaces. So now when I need to send traffic from one destination to another, I have uh, a set of data provided by the control plane. So in this case, we can see we want to source traffic from a, a virtual interface A with a source IP address of 192.168.10.10. We're sending it to 192.168.20.20. When that traffic arrives at our off-box device, 
we can do a lookup in the data that was pushed down from the control plane and we can first answer the question, given the interface that this is being sent on, what cloud network is it a part of, right? So I do first do a lookup, what cloud network am I talking about? Okay, now that I know what cloud network we're talking about, um, what interface is associated with this destination IP? So I can do a lookup and I can say, given cloud network zero and destination IP 192.168.2020, what is my destination being like? So I look that up and I'm told it's in this case, Vnix C. And then I can do another lookup to say, where is Vnix C hosted? And the answer in this case will be, it's hosted on 10.0.0.1. So to preserve the customer's original packet, we wrap it in another packet, which has that destination address on our physical substrate network, and we send it off. And when it's received, we can simply take that packet header off, we have the original packet is sent by the customer and we can deliver it to the host. And in this way, we know how to send all of the traffic the customer needs and we can transparently layer it on top of our physical network and allow flexibility, scalability and placement for customers' workloads. Make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So essentially what I heard you say was, you know, we are the, the, the off-park network virtualization devices essentially know all about the virtual network configuration that customers set. And it actually knows which one to reach for a particular customer's virtual network and customer's IP address. And actually directly sends the traffic from one off path virtualization device to another off path virtualization device. And the, the core of the network doesn't really participate in it apart from just transferring the packets blindly. Is that yeah, what I and that's, and that's a really good observation, right? It's that, You've, when you think about a traditional physical network, you have all of these components in the middle. You have your gateway out of your subnet, you have switching and routing that's happening. And in reality, we're able to deliver that illusion of a multi-tiered network in a transparent peer-to-peer -peer way to deliver low latency, high bandwidth and performance, non-blocking networks. We deliver on performance and scale and manageability by taking away all of that middle bit and sort of making it look like it's there even though it's not. Ah, so, you, the, when I, so when I actually get onto a virtual network and I see like a router or a gateway, if you will, what is that? Is that just the, uh, the off-box virtualization device that I'm seeing or is there some router behind the scenes? Yeah, well, it, it actually depends. When you're sending within the same cloud virtual network or between cloud virtual networks in the same region, it's directly peer to peer. And that sense about different gateways and routing, we're gonna enforce routing policy, you can set a route table, but we're gonna collapse that and use our intelligence and our control plane to give you a lower latency direct peer to peer communication path. When you leave your cloud virtual network, either to transition to an on-prem network or to go out to the internet, in those cases, you're going to hit our scalable gateway fleet, which is built in a way to give you the perception of an infinitely elastic, scalable and available gateway that is in fact, um, that is in fact our gateway fleet that is able to you know, handle an elastic uh, load of traffic in a highly available way. Got it. So most of the traffic doesn't necessarily go through an actual virtual device, virtual routing device, but even though some of them, particularly the ones that go out of the region, actually might. Is that correct? Precisely. And we are able to do all of this because our control and intelligence systems knows the location of every source and destination that could exist within your virtual network. And so we're able to use that intelligence to collapse that down into a simplified peer-to-peer -peer flat network. Got it. So essentially we're able to handle all the IP packets this way in our L3 network. How about, is that actually true for all the IP packets or how about ARP and like, you know, other types no, of packets? No, it's a great question. So, so basically all IP packets, with two exceptions. One is we don't handle IP multicast, and there are a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, and, and the other one is we obviously don't handle packets uh, that uh, for which there is no route. Like if you, if you try to use an IP packet to a destination IP that should be within your virtual network, but where we haven't assigned that IP address to an interface, I'm going to drop that packet because I don't know where to send it. And that really gets to the other thing you alluded to, which is the address resolution protocol. So you mentioned ARP, for those of you who are watching who might not be intimately familiar, sort of right beneath layer three, 
we need a protocol that can translate from these IP addresses into physical interface addresses or MAC addresses in the typical use case, right? And so the address resolution protocol is basically at its most basic level, um, you know, a protocol that says who has this IP address, tell me as based on IP address, and a response is given back uh, by the whatever host is hosting that IP address and says, oh, like I've got that. If you're going to go send to that IP address, send them to me. And the, the, the key thing about ARP is while it is a protocol about IP, it is not a protocol on IP. They're broadcast layer two packets to allow uh, communication between endpoints within a broadcast domain, typically uh, a subnet. Um, and so I just gave you a whole story as you identified about sending IP packets. Now I'm just talking about a protocol necessary to send those packets that's not on IP. It's a good question, what do we do? The truth is it's part of that fake out that we're doing across the board. So because I know ahead of time the location of every IP, and I also know ahead of time the location of every MAC address, when a host on our network says, who has 192.168.2020 tell 192.168.10.10, I'm just gonna go and respond with an ARP response directly. And you can actually see this, like I would encourage our viewers to go and log into a device on, on our cloud. And you know, if you run TCP dump, You'll see the who has tell go out. You'll see the response on the when when you make the request to send your initial packet. But if you do a TCP dump capture on the destination, you will never see a host respond to an ARP request. They don't happen because we're faking it out in the middle. And, and part of that is scale, right? We can return that response in very, very low latency. We know a priori where everything lives, and we faked out that layer of the network. Awesome. So what I heard was essentially we you know, we primarily focus on IP address in the L3 network. And then for the minimum set of things that are not IP packets, such as R packets, we essentially do a fake out so that it works. Yeah, we glue now, it together. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now, well, so most of the application should be fine with this, right? So why, why would we ever want the L2 network then? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I wanna answer it in a couple of different ways. Philosophically, right, as you talked about at the beginning of this call, we really have a deep product and architectural philosophy that we, customers shouldn't have to choose how to alter their applications and their workloads to, to gain the benefits of cloud elasticity and scale, right? And, and we should do that work to meet the customer where they are, whether that's physically or technologically, um, so that we're not prescriptive. You know, there are a lot of other clouds that talk about you know, being obsessed with the customer. And then they ask the customer to do all the work to take advantage of their cloud. Th that's not our game, right? So it's not typical. You're right. Most applications that are written in a cloud native way have everything that they need to be successful with that style of cloud virtual network. But if you look at our portfolio, we've got bare metal devices for customers who don't want to tolerate virtualization, even though many workloads can make good use of virtualization. We have local storage in our dense IO shape so that customers that want the performance that they get out of local NVMe drives can take advantage of local NVMe drives. And so as we think about the network, we're willing to go and grab that last bit to simplify that onboarding experience. So the exceptions that you're going to find in layer two network really come down to a small number of scenarios that are vitally important for a large number of on-premise applications. The first is the use of Macs and IPs without a preceding API call, right? The whole basis of the story I just told you is someone has to tell us what interface address you want to use and what IP address you want to use. And many applications that exist today presume the ability to just bring a unique Mac and take advantage of it or rely on um, that address resolution protocol to move IP addresses around in their application for high availability or scalability or really whatever else they want, it's up to them. And those scenarios aren't supported in a network where I have to be told ahead of time. The other thing that comes into that is latency, right? In, in HTTPS call where I have to do a whole handshake and, and make a key exchange and, and, and inform somebody and wait for my response code, that's not going to be you know, microsecond level failover, which is what many applications are written for and have come to expect when they move a MAC address or they move and use an IP address. And so really one of the key things is the use of those attributes with no preceding call and extremely low latency. 
And then we can get into scenarios like I should be able to multiplex and use lots of MAC addresses on a single interface so I can host multiple services on that interface. Or I need the ability to specify a virtual LAN ID to separate my traffic. And I need to be able to specify what that ID is. Or even in extreme cases, use of broadcast and multicast traffic or even non-IP traffic, right? We've talked about broadcast for ARP, but there are other protocols like IPX or let's say um, I want to use you know, IPv6 in scenarios that haven't already been defined. So it's really that breadth of those last level kind of uh, scenarios that we're able to enable through the use of layer two networking in the cloud. Got it. So what I heard was there's like, you know, there are some use cases, not all, but there are some applications that essentially, you know, want to kind of assume its own MAC addresses and IP addresses and potentially many MAC addresses and expect it to just work as it does in a traditional physical network. And they don't want to go through an API. Yeah, and a great example of this is, is our first product that we're using to leverage this layer two, which is our VMware solution. Ah, uh, got it. So VMware actually typically requires, you know, it, it just assumes multiple MAC addresses. Yeah, because VMware wasn't originally written to run in the cloud, right? And customers have uh, a wide variety of workloads running on VMware vSphere across multiple different versions of that software with their own tooling. And they want to run and control that deployment to VMware, right? And yeah. so the, it's what I love about this is it shows how our infrastructure enables the customer to take advantage not only of their own applications, but of the applications they've come to use from other vendors. And so we're able to offer a really interesting and differentiated VMware experience because it's not, we'll run VMware for you, bring us your VMs. It's, we'll run the cloud for you, go ahead and bring your VMware. Right? You so it. we can keep got running it. it because we can run that ESXi and the NSXT layer unaltered. It just works because we've built out the infrastructure that mirrors the on-prem. We've come to you. Got it. And then the other type of applications that you know I heard might use, you know, the might require L2 network is the one where it wants to move an IP address or MAC address without actually calling an API. Go go to the console and you know call an API. Just like you know, advertise takes over an IP address or MAC MAC address, and it just magically moves. Is that and correct? And this is that's exactly correct. And this is typical, mostly for networking appliances. So if you think about how a traditional firewall might have been developed and deployed in the on-prem or how a load balancer may have been developed and deployed for high availability or for scalability, you're going to see them taking advantage of these abilities to move resources within the physical network for which there is no parallel other than making an explicit API call and changing the application in a traditional cloud virtual network. Got it. Uh, awesome, that's that's great. So let's actually go into the L2 network itself. How, how does that work? Yeah, so if we think about the fact that what we're really talking about is customers having that control to bring their addresses and move them around, we have two problems. So the first is it's not simply a matter of, oh, I'm going to pick where I send this packet on the basis of uh, a MAC address instead of an IP address, right? I can't simply you know, go one layer down. It's not just about what I use, it's how I know it. Right, because we've said the customer just tells us using the protocols intrinsic in the network. And so we need to rethink that and we need to accept the fact that there's different behaviors here, right? It's, it's a different pattern of behavior. And so we decided to first and foremost, make sure that our customer is always clear about the behavior that they're gonna get. That's essential, right? We don't, we want a customer to be in control. That's an overarching goal here. So what we did is we expanded our concept of our virtual cloud network from just having subnets, which is our layer three solution based on IP, to also offering distinct VLANs. So when a customer configures a VLAN, they understand that the behavior within that domain of any instance launched and attached, there you're going to get our layer two behavior and layer two semantics. Within a subnet, you're going to get your layer three semantics. So now I need to learn all these things I wasn't learning before. I need to know where... Um, MAC addresses are in the network and what's attached to the network. Um, what I don't need to know within my VLAN is where IP addresses are because the operating system of the host is going to keep track of where the IP addresses are because they're going to actually participate in neighbor discovery if it's V6 or address resolution if it's V4. 
So we need to rethink that architecture. So if you look at the diagram here, we want to present the customer with a logical view of a virtual switch, of a single switch across all of the devices within that VLAN connected to the rest of the virtual cloud network through the use of a virtual router. Now, in practice, that doesn't scale, right? We can't send, we're not going to offer cloud scale and cloud elasticity by having all of the traffic go through a single instantiation of a switch. So what we do is we have the control plane now, instead of telling us where every Mac is, where every interface is, where every IP address is, all the control plane tells us is, what are the devices that are connected to this VLAN? And then what we're going to do, if you see this next diagram, is in practice, we're going to instantiate a virtual switch in front of every one of the virtual interfaces in that VLAN. So they're all going to participate in switch learning independently, but because of the nature of sort of the self-healing of the address resolution protocol and timeouts from ARP caches, they will converge and become eventually consistent so that we can give the customer the illusion of that central switch while scaling for elasticity. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So essentially what I heard was, uh, you, instead of IP address, you actually fundamentally use MAC addresses to do all the routing. And then the MAC address is really not like pushed down from the top or you know anything, it's, it's actually learned. And then you actually like the inside the con new construct called VLAN, we actually offer a switch and then a mechanism to connect to the rest of the VCN using a routing mechanism. And presumably both are, are those faked as well? The, the routers and the switches? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So the to some extent, the switch is faked in that we've taken what we present as a single monolithic switch and we've spread it out across the network. And we've had to make some interesting technical, there's some interesting technical challenges when you do that, which we can talk about in a moment. When it comes to leaving that VLAN and going and talking to the rest of the network, we chose to leverage an actual router. And, and the reason here is, you know, we've had a philosophy, you and I have talked about this a lot in the time that we've been here at OCI is, let's go solve hard problems. When we go and, and set off to do it, let's do it in a, let's solve the hard problem in a deep and reusable way. And that over time allows us to build up a toolbox of components that we can leverage to compose together to deliver complete end-to-end -end solutions for customers in a timely manner. So you'll remember earlier on, we talked about when you actually leave your virtual cloud network, when you go out to the internet or you connect through uh, Fast Connect or VPN to your on-prem, you're leaving our scalable gateway fleet. Well, scalable gateway fleet is a distributed, highly scalable router. And when we went and we built um, our NAT gateway, we needed to solve the problem of sharing state across that highly scalable fleet in a very low latency, scalable way because we have to store the NAT rules that we use to send the traffic. So now I have a scalable router that has a scalable distributed low latency data store. Okay, we're almost there. We've almost got a scalable router. We, we could have taken an approach of solving a complex gossip protocol to send all of the Mac learning to every endpoint, but instead we can take our scalable gateway fleet, we can take our distributed data store, and we can add on to that some things that we've done to build out our, our network load balancer to build a scalable elastic interface, we can compose them together. And now we have a virtual router that is real and scalable and low latency and provides um, all of that connectivity. And sort of as an inside joke, we refer to this as our real virtual router, the RVR. Um, sort of the reference that we have now instantiated um, an actual routing complex uh, uh, where in our layer three network, we virtualized it and, and faked it out. That's that's awesome. So essentially we built the scalable routing layer, if you will, you know, that actually is distributed. It can scale horizontally and it uses commodity devices and it actually has a replicated, distributed replicated mechanism in order to share state in a consistent fashion. We built that for the, you know, the, the internet gateway and the uh, DRG, the, the fast connect connectivity, is the dynamic routing gateway. And then we also leverage the same technology for our, our load balancing products. And now we are essentially reusing that for our L2 virtual routers as well. Is that what I heard? Exactly, that's exactly right. And, and I think it's, it's the way in which it pays dividends to really go deep when we solve uh, independent and individual problems. All right, so 
what I heard was like essentially for the virtual routers, we actually have a fleet uh, that actually you know uh, does high performance. It's, it's able to handle a lot of packets. It, it scales horizontally. That's fantastic. But does that mean that all the packets actually go through this virtual router fleet? So in like an L2 network, like you know, does no packet actually go from one offload uh, network device to another offload network device? Yeah, I think that's a critical observation. And the answer is no, we don't send all of the traffic through the central fleet because that would get in the way of our ability to offer that super low latency experience within the layer two network, right? We don't want to take any unnecessary hops. And so that's why we have this peer-to-peer -peer distributed switching mechanism. And there are some really interesting and subtle problems to solve when you have a distributed switching mechanism. And one of them is that information propagation, it's, it's not instantaneous, it's not atomic, right? So, so at any given time, if there's a MAC or an IP address being moved throughout that network using RARP or GARP, uh, a switch at the sender may have a different state. It may understand differently which interface contains the MAC that you're sending to than a different switch in the network, which may be the receiving side. And so there's the potential, if you do this naively, that I would send a packet and it would be delivered on the other side only to be redirected somewhere else and sent to yet another location. And there's two reasons why we want to avoid that. The first, most obviously, is we don't want packets bouncing around and getting loops and having a situation where nothing quiesces and, and ends. So that's bad. We want to avoid that. But the second one is we want to be able to tie customers into the higher level cloud constructs that we provide to simplify their management of the network, even as they're using something like layer two, which should tie them into their physical network and their experience in the on-prem. Again, it comes back to this idea that customers shouldn't have to choose between fidelity to their on-prem and the ability to access and leverage the benefits of the cloud. And so one of the things that we offer in cloud virtual networks is interface-based security policy or network security groups. That allows you to say, this interface is allowed to talk to this other interface. If the, if the, the network or the distributed switch itself was redirecting packets around, we couldn't know ahead of time which interface was to be the destination uh, for that packet that was being sent in order to enforce the security policy that says a packet shouldn't leave here unless it's sending to one of these whitelisted interfaces. So what we do is something actually interesting and a little bit subtle. When we send a packet, we send it directly to the interface, not to the switch on the other side. We allow that switch to learn. It learns the location of that source packet, and updates its tables, but the switch is only actually used when a packet leaves uh, the interface. And so that sort of should give you a flavor of some of the interesting challenges that we've had to tackle as we bring you know, our defined cloud network capabilities into this thing that's supposed to really emulate the experience of the on-prem. Got it. So essentially what we do is, you know, for you know, when it's possible, we actually you know, go from offload network virtualization device to the other peer offload network virtualization de device. There's a bunch of cases where that's possible. And then there are a few cases where that's really complicated. And as a result, we actually bounce off our scalable you know, virtual router fleet, or as we as you called it, real virtual router fleet, if you will. Uh, so that, that's really good. So let me try to recollect like, you know, how this works. So essentially, we, instead of using IP address, we use MAC address for all the routing, packet routing, if you will. Uh, the, the offload network virtualization still plays a key role in learning the MAC addresses and whatnot, but then it also leverages the, you know, the scalable virtual router fleet, real virtual, uh, virtual router fleet, if you will, that's horizontally scalable. We built it for multiple purposes. We essentially leverage that in this case to, you know, to handle some of the more complex cases of L2 network, as well as when the packet really needs to leave the VLAN and go outside the VLAN to other parts of VCN and perhaps to, you know, outside network using FastConnect. Precisely. So when, when two endpoints speak within a VLAN, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, super low latency, uh, while maintaining all of the flexibility and capabilities that customers come to expect from their on-prem network. When they leave that VLAN, the same thing happens as would happen in your on-prem network. The way you leave a broadcast domain is you go through a router to get routed to another peer network, only our router is infinitely horizontally scalable, very low latency, and ties into the visibility and operability and the capabilities that you've come to deliver and customers have come to expect of their cloud networks. 
That is great, Lucas. Thank you for all this. I, I think the, uh, you know, I, I can't wait to see how this is going to make a difference in our customers' life. I, I know we already, you know, launched VMware using this underlying technology and it's, you know, already being adopted by customers. And I'm pretty sure usually what I've found is that we launch something with a particular purpose and then we find that customers actually find that useful in a variety of ways. Sometimes we haven't even seen. So I'm really looking forward to how this is actually useful for our customers. Yeah, thank you for having me here to talk about it today. I'm, I'm just as excited. And I think it comes back to why we want to solve problems completely. We didn't want to go solve a narrow set of circumstances for VMware. We wanted to solve networking for applications that were built in the on-prem. I'm really excited to see what customers do with it. Awesome. Thank you for joining, Lucas. Yeah, thank you.